The Ric Flair Show. My name's Ric Flair. Woo! Woo! To be the man, you gotta beat the man. And I'm saying, woo! Right here, I'm the man. The 16-time world champion. Woo! Back behind the mic and telling it like it is. Woo! If you're not carrying the big gold, you're second best no matter what you tell yourself. I'm the best. Y'all playing catch-up ball. To the nature boy. And now, your host of the Ric Flair Show, Ric Flair and Conrad Thompson. Woo! Let's get going, man. Let's do it. Okay, let's do it, buddy. Freddie when you are. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, this is the nature boy, Ric Flair, 16 times your world champion, the host of the Ric Flair Show, along with the living legend, Conrad Thompson, owner of the Conradison Estate. And by the way, let me just throw this in here right now. I saw Nick Saban's summer place. Nick, you could park your summer place in Conrad's garage, okay? <laughs> Conrad, how are you, buddy? I'm good, man. I don't know about that, but uh, I am excited. We have got a lot of cool news to get into uh, the show today, so let's get going. The figure okay. four top stories brought to you by the RicFlair.com online store with brand new items, koozies, bottle openers, hats, money clips, T-shirts, and more. Check it out right now at rickflair.com and be sure to click the online store at the top of the page and get that Rick Flair for President hat going. All right, Rick, here we go. The top four stories brought to you by rickflair.com. Kevin Owens is the new Universal Champion and Triple H is back on TV. Let's start with Kevin Owens first. Uh, what do you think about the decision to put the belt on Kevin and what do you think about him as a performer? Well, I think it's great. Um, you know, uh, it's the last person they probably thought would go to. I think everybody thinks that's always going to be on set. Um, not last because of his ability. He's a phenomenal performer. Um, and anytime uh, Hunter's back on TV, you know, he's my favorite. And uh, he just raised the bar like we talked about yesterday uh, for the rest of the roster. So great to have him back on TV. Yeah, I'm excited to see what and, they do. And congratulations you. to Kevin. He works really hard in the ring. I think he's probably um, one of the last true heels in pro wrestling. Would you agree with that? Yeah, totally. Yeah, and he doesn't mind it. No, and he's great but, at uh, it. Uh huh. He's great no, he, at he it. doesn't mind it, and he's not worried about uh, people liking him or anything or selling merchandise. He just wants to be the uh, best performer he can be. Uh, so, what do you think is next for uh, Triple H on TV? Do you think they put him right into a program with Seth Rollins? I know that was the plan for WrestleMania this past year before Seth got injured. Do you think that's the new plan? I don't know. You know, I could find out, but it's kind of like. I'm kind of like you, and you know, I like just to kind of watch week by week. And, uh, you know, I could probably call him and ask him, but it's just more fun to watch. And uh, I just hope that it wasn't just, uh, you know, a flyby, that he actually starts participating in the show more often. He adds a lot to it. Uh, if you were booking, what would you do next with Kevin Owens? Uh, if I were booking, I'd, I'd put Kevin with uh, Roman Reigns right now. I, don't, I think that's a new match. I don't remember seeing that in, on a pay-per-view for sure. And I think that'd be a great match. No, I actually agree. I know um, some folks listening are not going to really want to see that for whatever reason. It's in favor right now to uh, boo Roman Reigns. But I think uh, they could have a great match together. Roman has had really great matches with AJ Styles. I see no reason why he couldn't do the same with Kevin Owens. Yeah, of course. Yeah, And and Kevin is legitimately, um, you know, that there, people are always going to, I guess, sway back and forth on Roman. Uh, but he's a really good performer and... Uh, and uh, definitely Kevin Owens is, is a bad guy in that relationship. Let's go to top the story. Ba- the, the heel, the bad heel. I like it. I like it. <laughs> Let's go to top story number two. Alberto Del Rio is leaving the WWE again. Uh, they brought him in about a year ago. It was a big surprise. At the time, he was booked with Zeb Coulter, then the League of Nations. Uh, apparently, he's not happy, and uh, he's asked for his release, and he's going to be uh, they've taken him off the house show, so it looks like he's been granted that. Uh, you know, it's easy to kind of look back in hindsight now. I know you think a lot of Del Rio, but uh, would you? what would you have done differently with Del Rio, and, and what do you think uh, his legacy will be in the WWE? Well, first of all, you know, I'm going to be always think that Del Rio's a hell of a hand um, and with a great look. I think he's a, profound, a phenomenal performer. Um I don't know what went wrong there, but I mean, you know, that's one of the things where you, you know, when you go to the office, you tell me you've had a bad day. I don't know what went wrong with the office. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
and, and obviously there's a misconnect there with him and the the uh, the people that uh, you know the writers or, or or even higher up than that and they just didn't see eye to eye but um, he does very well in Mexico and then um, um, in um, independent shows so he'll be okay and he's a great performer I mean you can't take his skill level away from him and, and a very nice guy I, he's always treated, always treated me with a lot of respect. It's uh, it's hard for me to imagine that he's done. Uh, I, I tend to think that he may be a guy like a Chris Jericho who can go away and then come back again. Yeah. Uh, not that Jericho worked for another company, but you know what I mean. Like he would be he would be someone who would be welcome back later down the road. I would think. Yeah, and actually, that the WWE doesn't consider working down in Mexico is like working for another company. It's not like he's going to WCW or. T and A or anything like that. He just he works independence and uh, you know he's very popular and he does really well. So let me ask, how shocked would you be if Del Rio did show up in TNA? Uh, I, I, I they they don't have enough money to pay him. Okay. I think he does very well independently and uh, he's like Rey Mysterio. Uh, he's always going to make good money. I'm sure Rey still gets really good marketing checks from the WWE. You know, based on his popularity at one time. So. Let's get to uh, top story number three. Uh, Daniel Bryan and The Miz called each other out last week on Talking Smack, and it really set the Internet on, on fire for a little while. Uh, I'm curious, did you have a chance to see this, Rick? And if so, what did you think about this kind of work shoot or whatever it was, promo back and forth with Miz and Daniel Bryan? I, I did not see it. Please run it by me. Uh, the gist is uh, Daniel Bryan was representing, you know, SmackDown as the uh, brand ambassador or GM or commissioner yep. or whatever. And, uh, of course, he drafted the Intercontinental title rather than saying he drafted The Miz. So when The Miz mm -hmm. was there, uh, Daniel Bryan's character, I assume, was very critical of The Miz and said that he uh, wrestled like a coward. And uh, The Miz took great umbrage with that and said that Daniel Bryan was the coward. Uh, because if he really loved wrestling the way he said he was, uh, the way he said he did, he would have quit WWE so he could go wrestle in bingo halls. Uh, so lots of people really took a liking to um, The Miz after that, and it was kind of the talk of the internet. But they didn't really follow up on it that much this week on SmackDown. So I'm curious, does this have a place if there's no payoff with Daniel Bryan? Or what, what's your takeaway on that? Well, once again... Um... There is no payoff with Daniel because he's unable, uh, at least as far as the WWE is concerned, to perform in the ring um, due to injuries. And, and actually, a lot of the injuries occurred when he was the Ring of Honor. Uh, less more uh, more with the Ring of Honor than with the WWE. Right. So um, I like Daniel a lot personally, but I like I like it when they start shooting with each other a little bit. <laughs> I think the show's better. No, I think so too. Uh -huh. I just wish I could shoot. <laughs> I got a lot of ammunition, man. <laughs> well, uh, that's what we're here for. Every time right? I shoot a little bit, we're all over the internet. That's <laughs> true. Let's go to uh, top story and number. And Finn Balor, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> Please get well soon. Oh, my gosh. Uh, top story number four. This is kind of a sad one. Uh, Mr. Fuji has passed away at the age of 82. Uh, mm -hmm. He was in the business for a long, long time, Rick. Uh, what are your favorite memories of working with Mr. Fuji? Well, it, actually, I didn't ever work with him. I traveled with him a lot, though, yeah. in the 70s. He was in Charlotte, and uh, he liked me, and he had a big red Cadillac. And uh, fun. I'm actually, um, you know, Fuji is, we'll go down in history, as one of the great rivers of all time. <laughs> I mean, a <laughs> bad river. So I'm actually, I'm, I'm glad he liked me. I never had to suffer anything that you know like a my car being painted a different color or my car being gone when i woke up in the morning he was a major river <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I want to ask you a story <laughs> that i heard that i you know i'd like to say is not true but uh if it's true it's the most ridiculous rib i've ever heard supposedly once upon a time he had an issue with jimmy snooker and he invited jimmy snooker over for a barbecue have you heard this story i have yes Okay, so for those of you who haven't heard this story, supposedly the situation is that um, Fuji and Snuka weren't getting along. Uh, Fuji tried to make amends, invited Snuka over. Fuji uh, did a barbecue, asked Snuka how he enjoyed it. He said it was good. 
and then he revealed that he had just fed Snooker his own dog. Is that accurate? Oh, I have, I have never heard that story, no. <laughs> that. <laughs> but, but you know what? I, I wouldn't doubt that for a second. <laughs> I haven't heard that, you know, but... Um, yeah, you know, back I don't think people are ever going to understand just how tough the business was back in the '80s, like that. And that's that I assume is when they both were in uh, with WWE. Um, but you know, Fuji was a great manager. He was fearless, um, had respect for everybody. You know, he he ran with that. You know, the King King Curtis right. and all those guys, and uh, you know, we Ray Stevens and everybody liked Fuji, and he was a big star and. Uh, yeah, and uh, he's a Hall of Fame brother, so uh, he had a good life. He's actually been pretty d- uncomfortable with health wise for a couple of years. So I, uh, at eighty two, I'm I'm glad he's in a better place. Yeah, we are too. We're going to miss you, Mister Fuji. Thank you for all the memories. Uh, we'll be right back with more Rick Flair show, and uh, we don't mean to end on a sad note. So on the other side of the break, we're going to have something that's going to put a smile on your face. We'll be right back. This week on MLWRadio.com, pull through Jim Corvette's drive through each and every Tuesday morning on this premium-only podcast. This week, Corny talks the Dusty Rhodes Gary Hart feud, Vince McMahon booking Japanese wrestlers, and broken Matt Hardy. Out now, over at the VIP Lounge, MVP talks with Cocaine Cowboys filmmaker and director Billy Corbin. Then, get the latest news and analysis on the network's flagship podcast, MLW Radio with MSL and ex-head WWE writer Alex Greenfield. On Thursday, learn about Cicero's disturbing stint performing for Handsome Boys Championship Wrestling. It's a new episode of Sardi and Mara Love Wrestling, plus much, much more. The world of MLW Radio never stops. Go to MLWRadio.com and binge on Pro Wrestling Talk now. Okay, we've had a few treats here on the show when we were talking about First Family Mortgage. We had some hilarious impressions And you can get all the hilarious impressions and some behind-the-scenes stories coming up this Friday. Isn't that right, Bruce? Oh, you better believe it because I've got the best co-host in the business, Conrad Thompson. And, (laughs) you know, we we always get to the the favorite part, at least my favorite part, your favorite part. seems to be everybody else's favorite part. What happened when? Well, here's a question. What happened when you signed up for a 30-year loan? Oh, my gosh. You know, I thought I was getting the best deal in the world. Little did I realize that when I got my first 30-year loan and I was 35 years old, I was going to be 65 years old by the time that thing got paid off. Come on, you know you can get out of debt faster than that. First Family Mortgage knows how to help you get out of debt faster and with cheaper monthly payments. It's not a matter of if they can save you money. It's a matter of how much, and you can find out for free with just a couple of clicks at 1FMC.com. Equal housing lender, NMLS number 65084. And be sure to catch Something to Wrestle With right here on MLW Radio this Friday with Bruce Pritchard. Now back to more Ric Flair Show. How to be the man. My name is Ric Flair, and this past weekend I spent with Dean Cain. Superman. Can you imagine Superman in the Nature Boy? walking into a nightclub together side by side knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that every woman and I mean every woman in the place was polarized mesmerized drop dead jaws wide open wondering, waiting, praying, hoping that we would have a wandering eye Dean Kane, Superman, think about it Ric Flair the Nature Boy, side by side, one club, one night. You think about it, but that's what's called being the man. Woo! All right, congrats again uh, to Mr. Matt Babb and to Joey Powell, who won our autographed title belts. We gave away a big gold. We gave away a dome globe. Uh, Just for listening to the Ric Flair Show and spreading the word, we're doing these giveaways. And today, uh, we're giving away maybe our biggest prize yet. It's an autographed replica robe. It's pink. It has feathers. It says the Nature Boy on the back. And, of course, it's signed by the Nature himself. 
Uh, this is pretty fun. I can imagine this will be fun downtown at the bars this weekend. It might be fun to style and profile into work on a casual Friday rocking this thing. Uh, and all you had to do to enter was simple. Just go ahead and retweet or share the post on your Facebook wall, uh, whatever type of social media you do, just to let people know about the Ric Flair show. And you had your chance to win your very own robe. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and name this week's winner of the autographed Nature Boy robe. At Domus Live on Twitter, you're the new owner of the Ric Flair Nature Boy robe. It's coming your way. Uh, Look for our direct message. We're going to go ahead and get this in the mail to you today. You should have it in the next couple of days, so be sure to go ahead and post some pictures on social media. Use the hashtag Ric Flair Show. Let everybody know that you're a subscriber to the show. We've got another opportunity for a big-time contest coming up next week. This will be our biggest contest to date. Uh, Let me go ahead and give you a little bit of a spoiler, though. You're going to need to go grab a new T-shirt supporting the Ric Flair Show from Pro Wrestling Tees. Just type in ProWrestlingTees.com, scroll down to the new arrivals, or just look for the Ric Flair Show. You're going to see more than a half dozen choices to pick from. Find the one that you like the best. Click that order button. You're going to get a great shirt at a great value. But when we announce the contest next week, you're going to wish you had one of these shirts. Congratulations again, Domus Live. We appreciate you listening, tweeting, retweeting, Facebooking, sharing, spreading the word about the Ric Flair Show. Let's get back to it. More Ric Flair Show. You're listening to the Ric Flair Show. You're talking to the Rolex wearing, diamond ring wearing, kiss stealing, wheel of dealing, limousine right. Jet flying, son of a gun, and I'm having a hard time holding these alligators up. The Ric Flair Woo! Show, and now more Ric Flair. Today, I am proud to tell you that God created some special people. He created heroes. He started out with Samson, then there was Hercules, <laughs> then there was Wyatt Earp, John Wesley Harden. Wild Bill Hickok, and then God gave the world and earth King Tonga, none other than Tonga, better known as Haku, without a doubt, the toughest person to ever step into a ring anywhere in our world, and I'm talking to Harley Race, who is my very close friend or anybody else, there won't be an argument about the legendary Haku. King, how are you, man? Good, thank you. My goodness, thank you, thank you, Rick. You know, I could, I feel like, uh, you know, I'm the the Samson now, and the Hercules. <laughs> yeah, well, well, you are, you are. Uh, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Arn Anderson, uh, a.k.a. calls um, Haku the human Vegematic. <laughs> 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 So you can figure that out for yourself, but <laughs> this, yeah, that's what happened when you all uh, bring me all the opportunity. You know, I was hungry. I was, you know, ready to explore the world, especially coming from a third world country. You know that uh, that the kingdom, a little kingdom in the South Pacific called Tonga. You know that uh, I, the king sent me over to Japan. You know, to be a representative of the country and, you know, a sumo wrestler to start with, Rick, you know that. And, yes. Uh, you know, what, what, so, King, I, I'm not to interrupt you. Tell, tell, them what, t- tell them the whole story. The Japanese come, came to Tonga looking for young sumo wrestlers. You were like 12 years old, right? 14? Uh, 14, yes. Yeah, okay, yeah, so, so start uh, there. They came to look for people like you, an individual that they thought could make it, correct? Yeah, they they think that, you know, because of our culture, it's just like Japan, that we sit on the floor and they believe that, you know, your bag is strong. You know how Japan in those days with the judo and, you know, yes. karate and stuff like that, you know, and, you know, they think that Tonga will be a, a good little... We were lucky, you know, they had Samoa and Fiji there, but, you know, our king also was a big fan of Japan. So, you know, uh, and also the sumo, because our king at the time, King Tupo the Fourth, was also about six, seven, and, you know, he's about, it was about three, four hundred pounds at the time, but, you know, he loved sumo. 
So, you know, that was uh, a great opportunity for him in his own, you know, uh, being the king. And, you know, he thought maybe there's uh, something that uh, bring to his people and bring the island to help, you know, to bring to help his people. I'm sorry to, you know, to, to get out there and, you know, uh, try uh, sumo. So you went to Japan at the age of 14. So keep yeah. going, man. It's a great story. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, uh, rugby players. Uh, there were 20 of them. And, you know, I was just in uh, 10th grade, you know, 14 years old. And Barbarian. Barbarian was one of them, you know, those uh, rugby players. He was a, a, a great uh, um, rugby player. And he was uh, two years older than me at the time. I was doing some sort And, uh, and you know, um, they uh, came in. The sumo people came into our school. You know, I was, uh, me and Barbarian were boarding school. So the 20 um, um, rugby players, there was our senior that he uh, was selected, you know, supposed to select the uh, whoever that they want to go on the, uh, uh, to Japan for sumo. So, you know, me being, you know, what I believe in everything, you know, go to church, Sunday school, and, you know, really, I said a little prayer there, you know, God, you know, if you think this talent is good enough for me, please give it to me. And, you know, it, it, you all have to see it. I still see it today, you know, how these people, they have no idea who I was there, you know, and I was just part of the students that were watching all those big fat people on diapers that they came into the school, you know. So, you know, we were watching it from outside, and they're supposed to go into the office there, and, you know, it's unbelievable, you know, how this guy, they never seen me before turn and look at me and, you know, just turn and, and walk forward. And um, after the meeting and everything, they told us to go to the assembly room, uh, assembly hall, where we get together, you know, for our um, meeting and stuff like that, the whole school. So, you know, out of nowhere, here comes that, uh, the principal. I heard the principal, you know, calling me my name out of nowhere. He said, make sure that you are going to the assembly hall because sometimes, you know, we sneak out of <laughs> meetings and stuff like that and climb the coconut tree and, you know, do it. You know, for, probably you all don't understand, Rick, but, you know, that's our food and everything, you know. You, you, you know, yeah. uh, at boarding school, you know, that's what, you know, a piece of bread, my goodness, you know, it's like a piece of steak, you know, those days for us. So, you know, that's what happened. Uh, we went in there, they draw a circle. Uh, called uh, Minami no Shima. It was uh, uh, one of the uh, rugby player pushed around one of the guys there. There were two sumo wrestlers were there. So and out of nowhere, that here they called me that I was just sitting with the students there. And, of course, I did the same thing. I pushed around the guy, and, you know, they turned around and looked at me, you, and you, exactly the word <laughs> that our boss was saying to us. You and the band, uh, <laughs> he didn't yeah. speak any uh, English whatsoever, and uh, and that's what happened. You know, we and you're you're 14, right now? 14 years old, yes. Yeah. Hey, 14. Did, when did they first uh, put the test on you to see if you to see how tough you were? Uh, we went there, and of course they had to uh, put us in. You know. Uh, Training, start training, you know, for what they call my sumo. You know, yeah. the, um, um, uh, it was, uh, you remember, Fukuoka, Kyushu. Uh, yeah. You know, Kyushu, Fukuoka, that was our first um, a rookie uh, tryout there. So, um, and, you know, we went to Tokyo and trained there, and then we had to make, you know, catch up with the... Uh, the rest of the uh, the stable or the club, they were already in Kyushu. So we walked right in there and, you know, started. We had three matches to prove to them that we can, you know, that we can do the sumo. And, you know, that was, you know, um, good. There were four of us, one from the police department, one from the, uh, the uh, uh, military, and 
two of us from the uh, from high school. One was senior. I was the uh, fourteen years old. But Bob didn't go with you, right? No, Barbarian was selected on the second uh, um, second time. Yes. So, okay. Uh, yeah. Well, how how much did you weigh then? Oh my goodness, I was only uh, 165 pounds. Yeah. Skinny and Easy. lean. Yeah. Well, w- when did you start getting bigger? I tell people I'm, I'm not jumping the story, but um, yeah. You know, before I before uh, I'm telling Conrad and our audience, and this is taped, uh, Haku. I'm just you know I didn't mean to interrupt you, but before I knew who Haku was, I was in Puerto Rico, and Haku only weighed about two forty five guys, and yeah. he was a phenomenal performer. We wrestled several hours, but I would have never ever chopped him as hard as I did if I knew how tough he was. <laughs> he was so nice and easy going. It was just the people, but God, no mistake, at 245 pounds, the guy was like Ricky Steamboat. And I promise you, I feel that way uh, from the bottom of my heart. You can really work. So go ahead Thank and start, start telling everybody before you started beating everybody up. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I really appreciate Rick. You know, that was something you know for me with my career. I think that was open up for me there when you you know he came in there twice and you know you took me under your you know uh, uh, as being the champion. You know you were so nice and kind and you know of course you know um, following you guys, you and Piper, God bless you. So you know that was something to me. It was unbelievable. You know as being from Japan and all that stuff like that, you know, it was unbelievable. But uh, with you and Harley Race, you know, I think that's the break for me uh, through there to um, um, start my my career uh, from Puerto Rico. There. Yeah. Besides beating up the people in Puerto Rico, <laughs> but you know, yeah, hey, <laughs> so can, can we jump in a couple a couple of years and tell the one story? About the Scotch mist? <laughs> are, are you still? Are they still trying to extradite you back to Puerto Rico? <laughs> I, I just don't want to go back there anymore. Because, you know, every time, well, how could tell the, tell that story? It's, it's well, Jesse I'm, Barr. I think it's know. Jesse Barr you saved, right? Oh, oh, the one in in Puerto Rico. Yes, yes. No. It was a kid from, uh, believe it or not, it was a Jewish kid from uh, uh, South Africa. Okay. Supposed to be a son of the promoter or something. David, I, I remember the, 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 the David, but I forgot. Yeah, I don't remember the last name. But anyway, he was there, and, you know, I was eating in the restaurant at Panama Hotel. And all of a sudden, we didn't. Victor, I remember Victor, came over. Of course. And, uh, young Victor. Young Victor, he came over and yeah, said, oh, do you mind if you take him out, you know, uh, for a couple of drinks? You know, he, he likes, he's supposed to have a, uh, he likes this girl at the bar, but, you know, he's, you know, he doesn't really know what's going on around here. And if you take him, you know, it would be nice. I said, sure. So after he ate, you know, we went out to the bar that he was, that his girlfriend was at, the girl that he likes. So we're standing there, have a couple of beers, and he introduced me to the girl, and we were having a good time and everything. All of a sudden, you know, about two hours later, this guy show up, just walk right in, grab the girl, kiss him, you know, put his tongue down his throat, her throat. And I said, what in the world is this? I said, David, do you know this guy? David said, no. So what the heck you let him do that, to the girl you like? You know, I didn't know if it, you know, it's just me, young, <laughs> you know, and I said, I, I don't like that, you know, some of you are my friend, and you know, you're my friend, and you know, he just, I said, bro, you can't do that, this is my friend here, David, you know, he likes this girl, and he wants to have a good time with her, and we've been having a good time, buying her drink and all this stuff, he can't understand, what, what did you say? I said, yeah, that's my friend's girl, you know. And he said, no, 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 that's my girl. I slapped that guy so hard that he went down on his knee, 
grab him by the neck. There's a window. You know, it's one of those uh, Caribbean, uh, yeah. uh, uh, you know, that wooden uh, window is open. And, you know, stupid me, I grabbed him by the neck and, you know, by his, his uh, pants. And I was going to throw him through the window outside from the second floor. I knew we are on the second floor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I thought you did throw him through it. So, so that sofa, the chairs and the thing, there was a big sofa there, you know. That hit me right on the foot, and I went down with the guy. Sit, he was sitting on the on the sofa while I'm I'm on on my knees on the floor there, and you know I just hammer him from the floor. <laughs> so. Here comes the owner, and he was giving me, oh, you know, you sell bits, you know, what you do is, you know, he's the best customer. He's the best customer of my ass. I've been paying all this the last two hours, and you're telling me that he's the best customer? So he's, I get up from there. All of a sudden, I turn around, there's this guy's, uh, I guess his people. I start looking at me and say, I say what are you guys going to do about it? You know, and here we go, fighting and then throw them through the walls and stuff like that. <laughs> and then, you know, I said, but, you know, I was worried about the kid. You know, I said, David, get behind my back and, you know, look for the uh, the exit. <laughs> look for the exit, you know. And they, these people, were, you know, Puerto Ricans, they were going to beat the heck out of both of us. So I fought them. And, you know, and, and he said, come on, you know, just keep coming, you know, to the stairs to go down as we went down, you know, and we ran off outside the thing. As we ran out, there is bikers are sitting there, Puerto Rican bikers, sitting on the, on the side there because there's a little grocery store there with food and stuff like that. And of course, I ran out and hit one of the bikers without, I didn't mean it. So this guy got up and grabbed his helmet and started swinging at me. I started beating up the guy. <laughs> And, and of course, here's the guy, and, and, you know, the kid said, Tom, come this way. You know, David was running in front of me. And, you know, here comes this guy who was running towards us. He said, you know, I'm a police officer. Stop. I hit him so hard. <laughs> I don't know. What <laughs> and we kept running. So all of a sudden, you know, I saw that. The uh, police cars are coming from the other side of uh, Condado. And by the time I said anything, you know, that one of the police cars ran over my foot and hit the brake. And by the time I turned to hit the guy, you know, the damn shotgun was right on my, <laughs> my head. <there. laughs> so, yeah, that was stopping us. I said, what happened? He said, what happened? You move our shoes. <laughs> I said, what, what did I do? Stupid. <laughs> So, you know, of course, they grab us there and throw us, throw me in the van, and they grab the kid and put him in, in a car. So I was with two police in the van, there, and, you know, the kid was sitting between these two guys. I guess, you know, they hit him with a stick or whatever while, you know, we're going to the police station. And the son of a guy, these two guys in the van, they were running, hit the brake, and they were, you know, turning left and right. And I'm bouncing off the damn van back there, you know, where they put me. I said, I'm going to kill you both. I'm going to kill this <laughs> in the van. You know, I'm hitting on the walls and stuff like that. So, yeah, that was the, the start of the thing. And they threw us in jail. And, you know, it was, I was always telling, if you remember, Ricky, there was uh, this uh, um, place was called the White Bear. As we're going on, yes, the other side there, Ponce and so as you you know leave town, it was on the left hand side. So yeah. you know, they always tell me, you know, don't ever go to this place; they're gonna kill you. Nobody ever come, you know, alive from this place. So you know, I never thought that I was gonna end up there one day. But anyway, that's where the, <laughs> this is where they threw me and David. We walk in there, you know, wear those uniform and everything. And all of a sudden, they saw, there was a, a jail there, they, you know, people were in there, they saw me. I guess they saw me on TV after all this time. And all of a sudden, it was breakfast time. <laughs> you can hear the cup 
running through the, you know, running on the, 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 um, the steel bars, you know, of the of jail, you know, King Tong, uh, King Tong, <laughs> the, the officers, police officers, and everybody look at what the heck is going on here. But anyway, you know, after that, we wear the uniform. I walk in the jail there. I said, if somebody touches me, I'm going to kill. I'm, I'm going to take a few with me, you know, before they fuck me in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh. but, you know, the kid that, you know, I was, you know, you know me, Rick. You know, I have responsibility to take care of that kid, you know, and I protect him, I guess, it. You know, David, look behind. Is anything happen? You know, I'll, you know, it's it's going to be a fight. You know, but you know, think differently. As we walk into the in jail, everybody moves back. They like they're trying to clean up and you know put me you know a corner there. They say, come on, come on. You know, there I was a celebrity in that jail. Oh, that's course, good, man. Course, well, that, yeah. that's when you that's when you you haven't been back to, since, though, have you? Yeah. After well, I, I went back, you know, for for trial two times. Yeah. And after that, you know, they they told me that I have to come for the third one, and I told them to fuck themselves. I'm not coming back to another one. You know, I was yeah. with uh, 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 Bravo then in Montreal. So, you know, every time I go there, you know, nothing happened. So, you know, after yeah. that, I said, you know, well, why should I go back there, you know? Mm-hmm. And so I just, so after that, they were, you know, they were looking for me to throw me in jail there. Um, so we could call me, you know, man, you had to come back, you know, otherwise they're going to come in. I said, so we can stick it up. Yeah. Nobody's going to. No, I know. I don't, I don't blame you. I, see, I, I, that South Africa kid was working the, Portland Territory. That's why I thought it was a Jesse Barr guy. I, I met that oh, kid okay. as well. He was working yeah. for Don Owen, and the Don sent him down to uh, to, for, to Puerto Rico for for Carlos. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was thinking it was Jesse him. Barr. Um, yeah. Well, you know, it's funny because um, I, I need the audience to understand what kind of guy Haku is. So I'm in Japan wrestling, and my wife, Beth, uh, Charlotte's mother and David, uh, Charlotte and Reed's mother, uh, was coming to Japan to meet me, and Haku was on the same flight, Conrad. And so they had a mechanical in Honolulu, and had to in, and uh, had LA. to spend the had to spend the night at the Holiday Inn, and yeah. he checked he checked Beth in the hotel, Conrad. Guys, on the truth, and he slept outside her door all night long. Wow. To make sure she was safe, and then we got to Japan and we had the damnest party that night. I go, <laughs> Jesus Christ! <laughs> what was I thinking about bringing her? <laughs> I was got married. Was got divorced there yeah, with yeah, you? Yeah. Poor Beth. Oh. Poor Beth. Yeah, but you know that's what happened, and you know I'm sure she understood with all the fans, and you know, Ronald, uh, Ricky. You know how Ricky is. He probably know you by now, Rick. <laughs> yeah, and, thank you. You. <laughs> you know, fun, you know, fun and, you know, all this stuff. And, you know, it's just, that's Rick Flair, you know, yeah. and he show up and he feels good and everything, you know, we fall <laughs> down and then, you know, all of a sudden, you know, he got up on, uh, remember that Rick? He got up yes. on the power, right in Ginza. And this is the most expensive you know, place in, in part, I don't know how, but in the world, maybe, you know, between Paris and Ginza, <laughs> Tokyo. And, you know, I remember Ricky got up right there and Beth said to me, Tom, please tell him to get down. Just before, <laughs> before I turn around and look at you, your your pants was on the floor and you're walking naked right on top to you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Are you sure that was me? <laughs> no. <laughs> hey, hey. And then, hey, Conrad, no. can you understand why we had so much fun, my God? Yes, sir. I knew I couldn't get any trouble. Hey, uh, King, tell the story about you and Mike Hegstra and Hawk. 
with the basketball players <laughs> in Rapungi. Oh, oh my goodness. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what well, this time the guy did go out the second story window. <laughs> oh, oh, that was yeah. It was those Irish guys. You know, it was Irish bar, and you know, I woke in there by myself, just being you know drunk and everything, and you know, all of a sudden, you know, I guess one Japanese was in there, know that I was a a wrestler, and you know, of course. The fake and all this stuff they turn around and said, you mate, you, you, you're a fucking, uh, uh, what you call, uh, wrestling, the fake wrestling, you know. And I said, oh, yeah, I am. I am the fake. You know, me, I always protect the business. And I always tell everybody, I said, do you want to see the real thing? You know, and I had to show them the real thing. <laughs> I, <laughs> But that was that, that wasn't the time with Mike though with the Hegstrand, was it? The time with Hegstrand is when the basketball players were in there. Um, no, you sure. <laughs> no, I think there was another one. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Hey, yeah, so everything. Yeah, otherwise, you know. <laughs> well, I've got some yeah. uh, some fun legendary stories that uh, some of our listeners want to hear about, and uh, Rick, you kind of mentioned his name earlier. And you're saying Jesse Barr. I think in 87 he was wrestling under the name Jimmy Jack Funk. And the legend, Mr. Aku, is that uh, he had some sort of issue with you backstage and you guys got into a scuffle and you pulled an eye out. Is that true or false? Uh, that's false. Okay. Uh, it was, yeah, let me uh, say this. It was in Ohio. I'm glad you bring up 87. I forgot that. Eight, a year, but we just had a big meeting, WWF, uh, then, you know, and Rins were asking, he was asking us, guys, it's about time, you know, you don't know how big you are now. You know, with the TV and everything is going on, you know, it's about time for you guys to act a little bit more professional, go to sleep early and all this stuff, you know and catch your flight in the morning and you know because it was you always early flight so yep. okay, i think what the the meeting was over in uh, cleveland or somewhere and then we had to go from there to dayton ohio i myself and you know and that's how we end up it was me kim doug and uh chesson far there you know and we drove from wherever we had and get to this, you know, I love country, but I'm a, I'm a country. <laughs> uh, I, I know. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. I love those country uh, uh, music and the country bars, you know, and that's where we end up that there was a band there and the whole thing, but we only have like uh, 45 minutes, I think before they close. So of course we brought like, two cases of beer right there, right in front of the band. And, you know, the band was going while we were chasing, you know, uh, the beer. We were drinking the beer like crazy. Anyway, by the time that we turned around, there was this, uh, uh, the band, and, you know, invited us to go to a place. Uh, one of the, the yeah, they have their fans, I guess, uh, there were about four or five girls who were standing, you know, with them. And, you know, they invited us to go to the, the, the one of the girls' places and you know, have a thing. So, you know, sure, why not? You know, here we are. But where we, you know, me, Bar, and King Duck, who was this the girl was driving, you know, beautiful Cadillac, the old uh, uh, two door, uh, I forgot the name of that. And the car was just painted, you know, and I guess, you know, poor girl saving that, you know, you save and paint the car, and it's beautiful. Anyway, we get to her place. The guys were coming from the back there. Anyway, I got out. There's Jesse Bar already climbing on top of the car. And the poor girl is. Screaming her head off and crying, you know, my goodness, I can't, you know, I can't believe you do this to my car. So, as I said, bro, man, you know, get off. 
So he come down, and, you know, Kim Tug was telling him, you know, man, no good. You no good. <laughs> and, you know, he turned around. And I said, man, you can't do that, you know. They're bringing us here to, you know, have a few more drinks and stuff like that. So he turned around and said to me, which side do you, which side do you, you, you at, you know? He, he, are you on his side or my side? I said, well, I'm nobody's side. I'm just telling you, you know, there's, there's kind people here giving us, you know, to have a party and here you are anyway. He said, oh, now I know which side you're in. And then I turn around, here he comes. You know, he was an amateur wrestler, and he, he was going to take me down. Just lucky that I happened, I don't know what happened, my foot went up and uh, hit him on the head. <laughs> and, and as he kind of struggled there and, you know, get around, he came back again, and, you know, he was coming to take me down again, and there was the, you know, ba boom, 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 turn him around, and I went right for, you know, for his eye. I felt the eyes was on my fingers, but I, I said, well, I can't do this, you know. So I just leave it there. I didn't pull it out, I, you know. And, you know, Kim Tech jumped on, you know, kind of, kind of, you know. What's going on here? Yeah, and, you know, that was it. After that, you know, I just walk away and have a phone call. You know, and lucky, uh, you know, whatever happened after that, that, they told us to go home and all, you know, Vince was pissed <laughs> at me, especially, you know. And I talked to him on the phone and I, Probably I should uh, tape it so we can, you know, it's just not because of anything, but because I never heard of him and I never see him piss like, I mean, mad like that. And, you know, that I have to, the call was from, I believe it was Houston, Texas, that I had to call him, you know, from there. And he was, he cussed me out like, you know, every, you know, bad words on the, uh, <laughs> that we all know about. But, you know, I didn't blame him because, you know, it was pissed because, you know, here we have a big meeting and, you know, the things happen. And I, you know, what can I say? I told him, I am so sorry. Things happen and, you know, that's that's what happened. He said, shut up, you son of a bitch. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, and, you know, there was, but, you know, hey, he was right. He was our boss. He was the thing. Yeah. That's what happened. That's exactly what happened. I didn't, you know, I didn't take his eye off. I felt it <laughs> in my fingers. <laughs> yeah. Hey, it was so, all, you know. King, I, I tell yeah. you what was great. I saw you this year with your yeah. wife, who is beautiful. And Thank it's you. a miracle that you have survived because Haku never did anything but have fun, Conrad. Right. Does that make sense? Yep. He wasn't a guy that ever ran around on his wife or anything. I mean, he just wanted to have fun. And it, it, and I was one of those guys, the instigator, that always, even when he didn't want to go, I would say, come. Or if he'd say, I'll have yeah. a couple of beers, then I'd say, well, yeah. just have one Jack. Oh, I'm, oh, I'm oh, guilty. Oh, oh. But, well, but oh, as, oh. As, as were a lot of other guys, because... He can drink beer all day long. He won't. He won't. Uh, he won't blink an eye. But when you get him on the Jack Daniels, it's it's a whole different world. There we go. Now he's talking. To tell them how you tell them how you put the you know every time I Conrad every time I go down to the bar that you know we were supposed to meet there, my my drink is already is to sit there. And well, that's because I, I wanted to have fun with you. <laughs> it's so much fun. You know, we're... This is the... Uh, go ahead. How much uh, Jack Daniel did you put in there? <laughs> <laughs> a lot. Hey, listen, Conrad, the, the greatest story of all time is me, Con, me, Haku, Arn, everybody's drinking at the jukebox in Charleston, South Carolina. 
And the manager of all people were sitting there at the bar, ordered a last round. And uh, the guy says it's the last call and all that. And, and the Haku goes, oh, come on, man, one more round. But very polite, you know, just one more round, right? So the manager, who's about six foot tall, comes around and there's me standing there, iron a couple other guys, right? You just, t- just tell him it's the last call, right? Instead, he takes his little finger, right, his front number one finger, and starts touching Haku in the chest, pointing at him, going, I'm not telling you again, buddy. You're out of here. And before he could get you're out of here, Haku had him goozled. <laughs> he was holding him by his feet, was swinging in the air. Next thing you know, the cops are coming. And me and Haku are running down the street with Colonel Parker. I'm <laughs> trying to hide from the cops. <laughs> you remember Haku? Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, the I cops remember. were everywhere, man. Ten squad cars, and we're trying to hide Haku. Me and Parker, and so they, we, they yeah, finally, so we, we they finally, all, go ahead. We tried to get you away, you know, before anything, you know, we'll go big there, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, uh, what's his name, the... the the sergeant, whatever, took you, took you off there, and you know me and Parker went down the street. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know how they found us. <laughs> the cops were following me and Parker there, and, you know. And I, you know, uh, what's his name, sergeant, that he took you, and then he come back. You know, I told him to, to make sure you're all right. Take you to the other side, you know. Otherwise, I, you know, I don't want the cops to 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 see you with us. And that's what he did. And he, but he came back though, Rick. Sergeant something. Remember that we had. Yeah, yeah, I do. I kind of remember that. Not I just long. remember yeah. you calling me and saying, "I got to get a lawyer." <laughs> yeah. 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 And it oh was God. We all sit standing there, and you know, poor Parker is that boys. Please, you know, they're coming to take us. I said, you know, okay. don't worry about it. You know, they don't want to take you. <laughs> yeah. If they want to take anybody, it's me. I'm the one who did it. You guys go you know. But anyway, but you didn't. You out. didn't even hit anybody. You just gave them the goozle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you know, in the same time, it's still town. You know, the police were just trying to make sure I guess yeah. uh, keep the peace there. But you know, the yeah. funny thing there, there were about you know about six cops there, men or seven, with one girl. So. I request them. That was the funny one. Thank God they were they were good with me. I said nobody is going to uh, um, put the handcuff on me. And then they all look at me. <laughs> you know, I said, you know, because it hurts. I've done it before. <laughs> so, you know, I just, <laughs> Are you hearing all this? It's too much, you know, and, and that's the thing is I feel bad, but the internet has so many of these stories. I feel like we could talk about stories like this. Well, we got to tell one more, which is the most legendary probably of all. And then we, we'll go back and talk some wrestling, but East St. Louis, which is a tough town. Kurt Henning, wow. Haku, and Haku walks out into the parking lot from the country western joint i can't remember the name of it but we all went over there we, and we knew there was going to be trouble we just anticipated it uh, i went to jail there one time but, but kurt henning was getting the living crap beat out of him by about five guys correct haku it was the whole damn um, bar there and i can't believe it because you know rick we've been to this bar and i thought they know us right yeah but anyway but anyway, I, I started it again because, you know, remember the seamstress? Yeah. For WWE. Yeah, that's how it started. You know, one of Ju- the guys, Julie and Terry and all them, yeah. Right. One one of the, 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 the guy called Terry a whore. And, you know, and Terry was start crying. I said, I said, you know, what, what's wrong with you? The guy said to me, I call her a whore. She looked like a whore. I said, really? You call my wife a horn, you know, and that's how he started. <laughs> the Kuso had run him to the wall, you know. By the time you get down there, you know, there were about two, 
three, four guys were all over. Again, I still have my pants at home and my shirt that night. You know, I mean, the fingers, they were trying to grab my balls and everything. And, you know, one guy kicked me right in the face, and I saw the star. That's when, you know, I went crazy. I get up from that, you know, I said, you know, this same damn thing here, you know, they're going to kill me. I get up, and out of nowhere, like Rick said, Samson came out. And I beat the <laughs> living shit out of the, you know, you can see my pants with those fingers, you know, tear my, you know, that's how hard they were trying to grab my balls. You know, and I was, uh, you know, came out of the damn thing and, you know, kicked the shit out of the uh, two guys there. And, you know, the other one ran. As they ran, he ran through the door there. Here comes the police. Yeah. You know, the, how many times did they mace you? <laughs> uh a few times, and then, you know, they hit me with a damn stick, and then, you know, as they go to throw me into the car, my goodness, if I didn't, you know, grab the the the, other, the police on my right hand side, Bobby, you know, they're going to, you know, take my head off. That's how mad they were on the thing, and that's when I turned around, the tall guy was about probably 6'4". I grabbed the police, jumped on his back, and beat him right on the damn neck there, you know. Uh, oh my goodness, it was so bad, I think. So, <laughs> I don't mean to laugh, but look, these stories are all the truth, Conrad. Oh my God. Yeah, and uh, that's my goodness. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate that, you know, they didn't shoot me right there, you know. But, you know, lucky thing, you know, the girls were there. they screaming, and, you know, you're going to kill him, you're going to kill him, you know. I guess they back off, you know, but the stink was. <laughs> <laughs> the stick were everywhere on my back and my head, you know. And so that was uh, the night in East St. Louis. <laughs> well, what what did Vince say about that? Uh, <laughs> Vince didn't hear about that until later. Uh, of course, with, you know, the, the thing I said, I believe um, Perfect just hit the belt, continental, continental belt, you know, and all of a sudden, you know, we were in somewhere that, you know, geez, I remember the town, one of the smallest states in the, here in the state, where is that upstate, uh, anyway. Well, let's talk about 1989. Uh, there's another yeah. famous story that everybody has heard about, and Rick has actually told this one on the podcast. And I'm not sure that you were there, Rick, or if it's just wrestling legend. But in 1989 in Baltimore at the airport bar, a guy calls wrestling fake, and uh, he left the bar without a nose. <laughs> what happened? Yeah, and that's why I'm still working today because of that story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I think somebody bit yeah. it off. <laughs> yeah, somebody. I don't know who it was, but you know, <laughs> I was just happy to walk by there. Somebody bit his nose off, and you know, all the, those guys were um, that they came into the courthouse and complained that I, you know, beat them up. Also, I, I never beat up anybody. <laughs> 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 Hey King. Yeah. Yeah. So in, anyway, I've, I've got to tell you this. Um, so I, I I don't get to see the King as much as I used to, Conrad uh, Haku. But um, when I do, like he came to Charlotte to shoot a commercial a couple years ago, and uh, I got him to come yeah, out for a while. You. And thank um, you. Yeah, you and you got me and uh, Barbarian to do the commercial there, Rick. Thank you. If I didn't say that. I, oh no 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 problem. But I, I met with you. You came in early, and we went to the Brio, and, you know, it's one of these guys, Conrad, you've got to meet him and be around him to understand. It's kind of like if I said to you, I'm bringing Hercules or Samson or Wild Bill Hillcock, you know all the stories, but you actually got to meet him. And, of course, it, it just takes me just a little bit, if I can just get his attention for a little bit on the Jack Daniels, and then the whole the whole world changes. <laughs> <laughs> I took them all around Charlotte. <laughs> it's like walking don't, around with Andre the Giant. <laughs> don't say that because he had work, you know. My boss, Mike uh, Cutchin, is give, uh, telling everybody, don't give him the uh, 
the the brown uh, the brown liga because yeah. you can't, no problem. <laughs> that's it. No, it, it just tastes so good. <laughs> Did I have to try it? <laughs> well, I want to say uh, in, in Orlando or, or in Dallas this year. I saw you, and I didn't. You didn't come down to the bar one time, did you? <laughs> no, I was in Dallas because I was yeah. with the wife. I, I know you didn't, come, but I'm saying that's a lot. That's a whole different guy than the guy I've known for all these years. I, I'm very yeah. proud of you for that moment. I haven't grown up that much yet. No, nope. I'm trying. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, you can't, you can't, you can't grow up. That's that's life. You know, that's what yeah. my. Uh, my boss always said, "Yeah, you know, you can't grow up, to it. You know, we we have to just, you know, be well, be you. Don't grow up." I said, "No, I have to grow up." <laughs> yeah. Rick, you mentioned uh, yeah. him a minute ago. Andre the Giant uh, was a tag team partner of Haku's, and Bobby Heenan once famously said that one of the only people in the world that Andre was scared of uh, was Haku. Do you have any funny Andre stories? I don't, but I mean, that, no, nobody, I mean, this, I'm not saying this because he's on the phone. Nobody screwed around with Haku. I've never seen anybody in their right mind, or certainly nobody in our business, um, say even, even, even in, and I was surprised to hear the bar tried to take you down. Um, I didn't think yeah. bar even did that. Um, but it was to no avail. People just don't do that. And, uh, He's got so much respect and built such a legend, and he's been able to stay married with a beautiful family, which is a miracle. Um, um, because of all, not because of anything he did to hurt anybody, but just having fun and the way our society is now. Which is, God forbid, you can't do anything anymore now. And uh, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't even, yeah. I wouldn't even try to get him drunk at a bar now because. You just never know what's going to happen. It's so bad with social media, but uh, he's in such a good place. I will tell you one of the greatest stories. So um, Bischoff was great, was creating this character named Glacier. Yeah. You remember, remember Glacier, Haku? Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, so I, 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 I was at the Marriott in Atlanta on Riverdale Road with Bischoff, and Haku was a and uh, uh, Glacier wasn't, and I told, I told Bischoff, and he actually gave Haku a job. Thank God, that, Gla- that yeah. Haku could beat Glacier in fifteen seconds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They spent six months on that gimmick. It never drew a dime, and Haku could have ate him. I mean, <laughs> Arn and I used to laugh about it riding on the road. Can you believe Eric Bischoff? Who knows some mixed martial arts thinks that Haku, that Glacier could beat Haku? I mean, hello, where have we been? <laughs> Jesus Christ! Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Bobby, he, he can. He was much younger, you know. The old timer, you know, can only go so far. You know, yeah, yeah. such a great guy. You know, it's just. You know what uh, Eric uh, Bischoff was believe on, and you know he already spent money and all this stuff. But you know, uh, the kid is a great kid. He knows what he's doing, and you know all that good stuff. You talking about you talking about Glacier? He's a gentleman. Yeah, Glacier. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. very good. This was nothing against him. This was not a personal thing. It was just it's just underestimating who you were uh, and understating um, not 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 really appreciating. What we were putting ourselves into. I mean, I'm saying this, and Barb is my good friend. Got a job. Bar- Barb does. Got Bar- a job. Barbarian does not argue with Haku. But, <laughs> That's just know, the way remember, it is. Ricky, I remember that you know uh, when Pisov were Pisov 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 were trying to, he told me that I have to audition. Uh, audition. Oh uh, my goodness! I was like, I know I really want this job, but. Audition. I didn't know that, you know, I'm going to make a movie here, that I'm in a movie. You know, remember that, Ricky? Of course I do. Of course. Yeah. It was insanity. We we were at Disney. Yeah. But thank God that you talked to him and, you know, uh, and calmed him down that uh, I have to get the job, you know, with the, uh, um, who, who, with uh, Parker as his yeah. um, bodyguard. You, you, yeah. You were his bodyguard, yeah, and actually you were. 
yeah. and mine and Arn's and, and Terry Funk. <laughs> yeah. But you know, the answer for calling it uh, uh Chris and uh, yes, I had a great time with uh with Andre the Giant. You know, Andre again, you know, I, God bless his soul. I don't know why he wants to be my me to be his partner, but, but you know, we had a great time. You know, the the big man likes the, you know, his food and his drinks and his women. So, you know, I'm just happened to be there and, you know, uh, be his partner. And, you know, there's something also that I respected. You know, I always, you know, I grew up in Japan, the respect, you know, for, uh, for, for you guys, Rick, was unbelievable, right? Mm-hmm. You know, yes. You like King, you know, especially you and, you know, the champion and uh, Holly Race. You know, and that's the, the thing with uh, Andre. You know, I wanted to do the same thing because I grew up with that. You know, carry your bags and carry everybody's bag. You know, I wanted to do the same thing to Andre. But, you know, there was something that even when we become champion, he said to me, no, boss, this is my bell, this is my bag. You, know, you go to work, I go to work. And that's what... You know, always he always carries his bag, you know, even though with the foot was hurting so bad. You know, and we uh, stopped before a couple of drinks <laughs> to make sure he's not there. But you know, that was yeah. the fun part. <laughs> of course. Yeah. You know, oh man. Some, well, yeah, it, it is true. It's funny because it's not the same way now, but uh, the Japanese culture, the people were so respectful over there. I mean, and Haku, yeah. I think he, what he means, he you know, basically spent like 10 years of his life over there. So the manners and everything else you develop. But also, yeah. I, I think you'll have to admit that growing up over there can make you pretty tough, especially in those dojos, huh? Yeah, yeah. In the dojo, you, you know, you get everything. You, you, you're learning. And, you know, that's how they believe. It's just like the flag. Everything yeah. is going around. You know, you start from the bottom and you go to the top. The kids that start from the bottom, you take care of them, and you know, one day that's the future of wrestling. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's the future. Exactly. If they look at it differently, you know, that's life to them. You know, that's how they look at. It. That's their life. That's how they they're going to make their you know in their way in Japan. So the respect and you know all the uh, um, that you grew up with at the dojo, that's how you're going to live. With. That's what you're going to live with. You know. Hey, uh, Aku, I'm going to ask, in all your years over there, did anybody ever mess around with you, like Yatsu or, or uh, uh, Jumbo? No, no. Uh, there was, but that's the different, Rick, you know, the respect, you know, for your senior. Yeah. You know, no matter what, you know, they can beat the heck out of you and you can still stand there. That's That's respect. You know what I'm yeah. saying? And then, you know, one day I'm going to do the same thing. They do to me or do to whoever, to, you know. They accept that is it's going to happen, and is if it's going to happen, that's how it's going to be. You know, you just yeah. you know take it like a man, and you know, and that's what it is. But it never happened. You know, there was some, yeah. something. You know, well, I I think I would have heard if it did. I just didn't know because uh, you know a, a, a lot of the guys, which it's, it's different now, and unless you experienced it. Um, the, the kids in Japan in the 70s and 80s, they all thought they were tough. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, yeah. real tough. They I mean, like, fight Harley, yeah. fight Terry Funk, right. fight Haku. I mean, anybody. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and beat and, and kill me. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> they, left me, they left me alone because knew, they knew I was your buddy. <laughs> uh, Haku, I've got to ask... I've got to ask a question yeah. that uh, Kevin Sullivan told a story to us once about that almost seems make believe, but he says that once upon a time you guys were in a bar playing pool, some guy made a slur at you, some sort of racial slur, and um, he got chunks bitten out of his back. <laughs> it was <laughs> that's the devil, all right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I told the story, you know, but. Uh, you know, it, it's shame for me to say that, but that's, you know, the moment and everything that, you know, like that, you know, I've been calling all kind of names, you know, I walk in the, 
you know, middle of Nashville and they've been calling me a nigger and all this stuff, you know, that, you know, call me and, uh, uh, you know, coconut, you know, uh, fucking coconut, you know, assholes and stuff like that. But, it, you know, it's hard that, you know, the the disrespect, I think, is always, you know, like we just talked about, you know, I come from Tonga, that we have a king and all that stuff. We have a noble, we have nobles, you know, and we all respect them. And then you go to Japan, you know, and live the sumo wrestlers supposed to be, you know, the last samurai, you know, life in Japan that, you know, that lives, you know, they, we still wear... They still wear the kimono, the hair, you know, style of the samurai and everything, you know. So, you know, that's the respect that I had in me, you know. Why do you have to say that to me? Why you call me a nigga? Why you call me a coconut, fucking coconut, you know? That's the thing that I, you know. I, so, you know, those are the things that it get to me. And, and, you know, hey, I never call you anything. I have been, you know, we've been having a couple of drinks and, you know, we're playing uh, pool here, you know. Why do you have to get involved? And that's when I uh, just, you know, back to the same thing in Puerto Rico. This guy, you know, that, you know, came in from Philadelphia and, you know, he called me, a, a, you know, a fucking Puerto Rican. He didn't even know who I was, you know, and, uh, but he was Puerto Rican. Live over there. That was my first lawsuit out of the damn WWF. So I beat the head out of him and kissed him on the lips, and I said, I love you, man. I love you, man. You know, that's <laughs> how I, I feel, you know, you don't know me. Don't disrespect me, you know. You know, who the you are to come and, you know, call me out, you know. And I'm going to say, okay, I'm Puerto Rican here, yeah, but what are you then? Okay. You know, but he was from Philadelphia, and I remember that. Uh, son of a gun, you know. But I kissed him. I told him I love him, and it was true. <laughs> I loved him. You know, because, you know he was... Conrad, you got to have him to the Conradison, man. What a time today, Haku. We appreciate you taking a few minutes out yeah. with us. We'd love to uh, let people know, you know, how to keep up with you. Is there anything we can plug or promote for you? No, no. Just... Uh, you know, as the good Lord has been good, you know, that they have Rick on my side there. Got me, you know, his family is a great family. You know, Charlotte, that I'm so proud. She's, you know, it's remind me, you know, the working, you know, that they have the fathers, you know, that, you know, or maybe, I'm sorry, Rick, to say, you know, but she's so good. You oh, know, gosh, and she's better than me all day long. I'm the first yeah. to admit it. I, I have to say one thing, and I never like to end uh, <laughs> things on a sad note, uh, but it's something I've, I've learned to live with and at Haku has yeah. too. But when my son Reed died, I got a phone call. I wasn't answering the phone, and the, and the voicemail said, say it's not so. Yeah. I'll never forget it. I have it saved on my phone yeah. to this day. Thank you. Yep. You know, I say, know the kids are say it's not kids, so. He la- he loved my kids, and my kids yeah. loved him, all of them. Yeah, you know, you're my family always. No matter. We've been you know, together a long time, so man. Much. Yeah, we've been on the road. You know, we 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 got We got to get you and me and Gomez and Conrad together one night and have just one night out again. Let's do it. One night. <laughs> 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 Gomez has really settled down too. What the hell? Yeah. Jeez. Yeah, Goldberg, I don't know what's, you know, family, I guess, you know, have the, uh, you have also, I guess, a son now. So he's really, you know, you talk, you're talking about, about Gomez. Oh, Gomez. Gomez. Yeah, yeah. Gomez. Yeah, Joe, yeah, he's got a baby girl. Yeah, yeah. I saw him a couple times, you know, yeah. on this side here, you know. Uh, that's where I'm working at right now. So, where are you guys? We, at, Rick? Are you in still in the uh, Carolinas? No, I'm, I'm in Atlanta. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, so, okay. And you're 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 in Kissimmee, right? Yeah. 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 
Okay. Well, well, WrestleMania is right there next year, man. I'm sure we'll see a lot of you. And it will, it will be my mission and my pleasure to get you out one night. <laughs> yes, yes. We'll, we'll go out book here. Yeah. Or two. We'll just go to some quiet place. <laughs> yeah. Quiet place, please. I love you, man. Yeah, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I love yeah. you, buddy. Yeah, love you too. Greg. You know, you guys take care. Thank you, sir. Stay, stay right. safe. Thank, Thank you. you. Right. Thank you very much, yeah. sir. Yeah, please take care of Rick there. I'll do it. I'll do my best. Yeah. It's a full-time job. All right. All right. Yes. <laughs> of, course. of course. All right. Love you, Rick. Love All you, right. Haku. Bye, man. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, certifiable, going to be a Hall of Famer, one of the most legendary uh, wrestlers of all time, and the stories behind the scenes are even better than what we saw on screen. Yeah, I mean, we never even uh, talked about what a great performer he was. I mean, you know, sometimes those things get, get left out, but um, phenomenal performer. And when I worked with him over there in uh, Puerto Rico in the early 80s, I mean, I had no idea how tough he was. His reputation hadn't come that far yet. But, boy, could he work. You know, he weighed about 240 pounds. And, um, but, you know, to this day, and he probably weighs like 320, he can put his, up, his right leg in a door jam. That's crazy. Yeah, I mean that's from being so limber as a, as a sumo. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, but you've met him. He's a he's a he's a man and a half boy. It's a it's a huge honor to have him on the show. One of our most requested guests, and uh, we're not done with this show yet. On the other side, uh, voicemail of the week. Ask Nate, and this week in history, we'll be right back on the Ric Flair show. Goodness gracious, quick balls of fire! Woo! The Ric Flair show. Don't miss a minute of the Ric Flair show. Subscribe on iTunes now. Woo! Nature Boy Ric Flair, the heavyweight champion of the world. Custom made clothes. And any woman in the world I want. Just like that. Okay, so now we're going to do something different on the show. We're going to do our very first unboxing in the history of maybe podcasts ever, but certainly in the history of the Ric Flair show. We're talking about our friends at LootCrate.com. Uh, now, here's what you need to know about Loot Crate. They have just partnered with the WWE to create, I don't know, maybe the greatest tag team in crate history. So here's the concept. It's the WWE Slam Crate. It's a bi-monthly mystery subscription service for fans of the WWE Universe, meaning you don't know what you're going to get. It's even better than that box of chocolates that Forrest Gump talked about because it's filled with wrestling stuff that you really want to see that you can't get anywhere else. That's right. You can't get this stuff anywhere else. Let's run through what you might see in one of these first crates. A shirt back from the grave. A shirt you can't get anymore. You never thought it would be offered again, and now you've got one. Accessories from a special first lady. An insane clothing accessory. The first card from Austin Aries. And some of the crates will actually have autographed versions and a special treat to commemorate the first in-ring destruction of its kind. Now let's run through this again. This stuff is exclusive. You can't find it anywhere else. It's only inside the WWE Slam Crate. You'll get one every two months. So every two months, you've got a box of goodies at your door waiting on you. And for less than $30, you'll get more than $60 retail value in every single crate. We're talking licensed gear, apparel, collectibles, one-of-a-kind items, and more. And Loot Crate is offering our listeners the chance to save $3 off your new subscription. Get ready to rumble and head to LootCrate.com slash Flare and enter our code Flare. Don't wait. There are only limited qualities in the Founders Crate, and once they're gone, they're gone. You won't be able to reorder this again when they're sold out. So get the best in WWE swag and save $3. Just go to LootCrate.com slash Flare and enter our code Flare. And be sure to follow them on Twitter, at LootCrate. And when you open your new box, use hashtag Ric Flair Show and hashtag WWE Slam Crate. And now let's do something fun. Let's let Rick Flair unbox his very first Loot Crate. Oh, my God, Loot Crate. This is so awesome. Holy cow, all this for the Nature Boy? My God, Loot Crate, you rock. Woo! All right, the more things change, the more they stay the same. The Nature Boy is still doing it up. He's coming to your town, and I'm talking to you, Dallas, Texas. He's going to be in town this weekend, September 3rd, for the official USC Alabama VIP Ultimate Tailgate. It's right across the street from the Cowboy Stadium, and you don't want to miss him. He's going to be at the Fishbone Grill and Sports Bar. You can still get your tickets online. Uh, and, of course, next weekend, he's making his way up to New Jersey. You don't want to miss it. It's going to be Saturday, September 10th for WrestlePro in Rahway, New Jersey. 
Don't miss it. Rawway Rec Center next Saturday, September 10th. The next day, he's back in Dallas again, this time for the Cowboys Giants. Once again at the Fishbone Grill and Sports Bar. That's on Sunday, September 11th. Let's fast forward towards the end of the month, September 22nd, 23rd, and 24th. He's going to be representing big-time wrestling, and they're going all through Flair Country. We're talking Morgantown, North Carolina on the 22nd, Dorton Arena on Friday the 23rd, and on Saturday the 24th, he'll be in Spartanburg, South Carolina. On October 7th, he's headed south. He's going to the Orlando Comic Con. The very next day, he'll be in Indianapolis. It's October 8th. Towards the end of the month, October 22nd, you'll see him at Collateral Damage in Pennsylvania. And October 29th, this is a big one, mark your calendars, MAB Celebrity is bringing the four horsemen back together, and they're going to be in Pittsburgh. They got the Barry Windham incarnation with Arn, with Tully, with JJ. It's the whole gang. You can find out about all these appearances and more. All you've got to do is go to rickflairshow.com, click Appearances in the top right-hand tab, Now back to more Ric Flair Show. It's time for this week in history on the Ric Flair Show. Woo! Brought to you by MidAtlanticGateway.com. Dick Bourne and David Chappell are celebrating the memories of Jim Crockett promotions every day at MidAtlanticGateway.com. Man is Razor Ramon. Well, earlier, Savage Sucker punched Razor Ramon. What do you expect him to do? You don't push Razor Ramon around. He's my cheese mo, man. Lessons in my cheese mo. If ever we have seen my cheese mo, it is from Randy Savage, who against all odds at this moment remains the World Wrestling Federation champion. But the clock on the wall says that's all. The hands are ticking. His time is numbered. Randy Savage in excruciating pain now. Thanks to Razor Ramon. Oh, oh, look at Flair. Oh, he's got him. He's got him. Taste the champagne and the bubbly. Savage reaching for Flair. He's got him. He's got him locked. The pain must be excruciating. He's got him locked. He's got him. He's not getting out of this. Ring Randy the bell. Savage is hanging on. Ring the bell. Trying to reverse it. Get Flair over. Look at Flair. Straining with all his might. Once he locks it on you, you don't get out. Come on, Randy show some compassion. Savage with the heart of a lion. Hanging on. Rich your teeth, pal. It's over. The party is over. Savage Come on, guys. Is mobile? Reaching for the rope. He's getting closer to the rope. Do the humane thing. Ring the bell. Make it easy on yourself. You got him perfect. You got him worried. We want him. Right on his back. Oh, yeah. Randy Savage is still fighting the figure for a leg lock. I have never known anyone to fight the figure for a leg lock as long as the Macho Man Randy Savage has. Look at this courageous effort. And I've never known WWF champion. And I've never known anybody to get out of the figure for a leg lock once Flair has it properly applied like he does right now. Plus, the man's got a bad wheel. It's all good for Savage. Randy Savage will not surrender. He will not give up. He's not. Wave the white flag. Tell them where the ships are. Turn state's evidence. It's over. It's over. Randy Savage refuses to submit. Look at this. What an unbelievable effort by the Macho Man. If he gives up now, he gives up now, he's got a chance. Maybe a chance to walk around eventually in six months or so. If he don't give up, it's going to be over. He'll never walk again. Randy Savage still hugging on. I've never seen anybody in this figure four for as long as Savage has been in it, plus with a bad wheel like that. This man is not right. His mind is not there. Mr. Perfect must be worried. Ric Flair must be worried. Why has Randy Savage not surrendered? You've got that look on your face, too. You've got the same look on your face. You can't believe it. Randy Savage against all odds. No way you don't. No. Randy Savage, he's, he's blacked out. I think he, he's unconscious. 
This week in history, we're going to go back to September 1st, 1992, and we're in Hershey, Pennsylvania. Uh, in this match, you defeat Randy Savage for your second WWF World Title run, and you have a little help from Mr. Perfect and Razor Ramon. Uh, at one point, you threw a drop kick in this match, which I've heard you say before, you never did. Uh, and then you win with the figure four, which you also say you never did. But it's by pinfall, not submission. Uh, what are your memories of this match, Rick? Um, well, actually, it was one of the most embarrassing moments of my life. <laughs> we were in Hershey, Pennsylvania, and the match was going so badly because of miscues of different people by interfering that they started the match over again. <laughs> so it was really rough the second time around. And we went through introductions, everything. Started the match all over again, and it's one of those deals where there were so many people involved in the match, it wasn't really... I mean, obviously, I got credit for the win, but I, I, you can't say I won with two other guys in the ring with me. So I did win, and I'm thankful for the opportunity, but it was one of those things that a lot of politics involved. Back then, it was, you know, with just everybody was looking out for themselves, or I was just trying to have the best match. So, And I can say that in all honesty about myself. I certainly have looked out for, looked out for myself on different occasions. But not to the point where I was going to not do something because there weren't enough people in the ring. So um, I'm, I'm honored to have had that moment, but um, it's not one of my favorite title wins. <laughs> so let me ask this. When you're saying, you know, everybody was kind of looking out for themselves and there was, you know, a political climate. Are you suggesting that, that Randy would have been the one who wanted all of these extra layers of interference that maybe overcomplicated the situation? Oh, most assuredly. Okay. <laughs> Why would I want three guys running in? All right. I get it. I just wanted to, you know, not put words in your mouth there. No, when Bobby Heenan came down to ringside and said, stop the match. <laughs> <laughs> you can imagine how horrified I was. So, uh, the, the and, and then to walk back and have a guy that I was named on after mention, tell me that's the worst bunch of crap I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> I have a, I've had a couple of those or a, a couple of those brawl beatings over the years. So you're not an '80s heel. '80s heels don't draw. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that means, but uh, I do appreciate you putting this in your wayback machine and uh, maybe highlighting. No, it means that in the 2000s I was doing stuff I did in the '80s, and he would get so frustrated with me, he would say to me, '80s heels don't draw." <laughs> okay, excuse me. He, he, <laughs> look, look look back on your library now. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not even saying who I'm saying that to. <laughs> no. And before we get out of trouble, uh, let's go to Ask Nate. Ask Nate brought to you by MacWeldon.com. Look great and feel great with gear that's better than what you're wearing right now. And get 20% off using promo code FLAIR at MacWeldon.com. If you'd like to ask Rick a question, just tweet using hashtag Ask Nate. And we can ask your question next week on the show. Hit me. All right, Rick. So uh, this week's question comes to us from Tony Barker on Twitter, uh, at TonyWingDog72. Uh, he says, hi there. Just wondering if you had any fun baby doll stories that you could share. Hashtag Ask Nate. Uh, Rick, we get questions about baby doll all the time. Uh, she was uh, in the business when it was at its very, very height, uh, but not for very long. So there's uh, a lot of mystique around her, but uh, I know you spent some time with her back in the day. Tell everybody, you know, your favorite baby doll stories. I, well, I really don't. I actually was, you know, very close to her dad. I wrestled for her dad, who uh, was in that Amarillo Territories. Um, and that's how I got to know her. And then the next thing I knew, I was um, wrestling in a sportatorium, and she was managing Gino Hernandez. And they were called her Nicola. I can't remember what her what her name was, but um, she had the spikes on like the road was. <laughs> the next thing, they had her interfere in the match, and she was beating the crap out of me. So <laughs> uh, when she came uh, to the Carolinas for Jim Crockett Promotions, 
she fit in perfect. She was actually Tully's valet, you know, 90% of the time. And then Dusty's for a while, we switched back and forth. But uh, she worked hard. Um, a really nice person, very respectful. And uh, I see her uh, periodically now, and she's, uh, she's still the same wonderful person that she always was. And uh, I believe she's happily married again and, uh, and doing well. I mean, you know, she does the independent stuff, but she... Um, is living somewhere strange, but in a private area. But you know, I, I think her life is good. And uh, you know, like I say, she was a big time player when we were when we had that run in the eighties. Absolutely. If you're not uh, familiar with Baby Doll, I don't have any romantic stories. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, uh, I know. I know you're dying to hear something exotic, but I don't have one. Sorry. No, you. I, I didn't. I didn't think that at all. Uh, I know at the time you were a happily married man, and that's not something you would ever entertain. That. Thank you. You yeah. are. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's, let's get to uh, this week's voicemail of the week. The Ric Flair Show voicemail of the week. If you'd like to be the next voicemail of the week, just call the Ric Flair Show hotline, 844-RIC-SHOW. Leave your name, city you're from, and your hot take. If you've got what it takes to style and profile on the show, call now. Toll free, 844-RIC-SHOW. Now, here's this week's voicemail of the week. What's up, Nate? What's up, Conrad? This is Josh Morningstar. I'm from Town, Maryland. Huge fan of the show. Think you guys are awesome. Right now, it's 3 o'clock in the morning. I'm on I-64 in uh, eastern Kentucky and the good old music city, USA, Nashville, Tennessee. I'm a musician. I spend most of my time on the road about 250 days a year just trying to keep up with the nature boy. And uh, I wanted to ask a two-part question here. Nate, what's your favorite city to party in? And the second, what was the, the biggest dollar amount that you have ever spent in one night, Nate? Uh, thank you guys very much for doing the podcast. Nate, you're a legend. Conrad, you're awesome. Woo! All right, Rick, so this is a fun one. Uh, we've talked about Nate quite a bit here on the show. Uh, so what was your favorite city to party in, and what was your biggest bill for a night out? I'm interested on this biggest bill part. Whoa, my favorite city to party in was Chicago, but that isn't where I spent the most money. The two cities I spent the most money in on a night out were Baltimore after the um, Crockett Cup at the Marriott. Um, and then, of course, the Las Vegas night for ten grand at the uh, Caesar's Palace. So they both were tied. They're both in the ten grand range. So for a night of a night of nation. Uh, and Chicago, yeah, maybe three thirty five hundred, but nothing, <laughs> nothing too much. <laughs> thirty five hundred in the eighties was a considerable amount of money. It still is today, but yeah. in the eighties, that was a lot of money. So. Uh, yes. What, what was the uh, what was the watering hole of choice in Chicago? Oh my gosh! It's changed its name now. It was legendary. Um, the Palace Hotel Ballroom. I, mm. I saw Tully Blanchard once say it was the Snuggery. Yeah, Snuggery. That's it. Thank you. Just drawing a blank there. Uh, the Snuggery, and then of course, my friend Bruce MacArthur owned the Bismarck Hotel, and we did a lot of damage in that place too. But the Snuggery, and then. Uh, Chris Chelios. Chelios was a place. Chris Chelios was a hockey player. Right. Uh, I had a place that was real popular for all of us. And we hung out, hung out, hung out there a lot. At Chicago, free hard to beat Rush Street anywhere. Especially in the summertime. Man, it's beautiful. So uh, talk me through $10,000 in a night. Uh, that seems like that's uh, pretty difficult to do. I, I get how maybe it might not be in Las Vegas, but... How in the world did you spend ten grand in a city not named Las Vegas? Well, as you know, I, and I've had some big nights in New York too. You know, you walk into these clubs where it costs you two grand to get into a private box, and you you're buying you're buying bottles of uh, Grey Goose or uh, whatever your you know, other high end liquor would be for five hundred dollars a bottle. You got ten people. You can go through that stuff fast. Hey, you know that, right? Are you kidding me? I just went through that. I mean, I'm unbelievable. Do you see that? Where was I at? Uh, with you at Jay Z's? Well, the TSM, that that place. We did. We, we were only there an hour, thank God, because we could have spent ten grand there. 
the, last uh, weekend. The worst bill I've ever seen was at Nick and Sam's in Dallas, and that was brutal. Yeah, I know. That was that was 7000 <laughs> <laughs> for dinner, for dinner. Thank God, you, thank God, you had the tin credit card. <laughs> I, I've never been to a place before where Rick says, "Just bring us everything. We'll take everything." This whole well, I side didn't know right here. how many places are in the country that has a menu with no prices on it. <laughs> well, <laughs> they had prices on the ticket. I'll tell you. That. I'll actually be there Friday night <laughs> again. <laughs> Can I can I use the tin credit card while I'm out of town? Okay, let's uh, let's move along. <laughs> let's uh, let's get out of here and get some Twitter plugs to our friends. Follow the show online. What are you waiting for? At Rick Flair Show. Of course, we're on MLW. You can find them at MLW. Uh, at MA Gateway, got to check them out. Big shout out to our friends David Chapel and uh, Dick Bourne. They're helping us in a big way on this week in history. Uh, at Jerome Fisher VO, if you want your show to sound as produced and as well put together as this one, hit Jerome up at Jerome Fisher VO. I know what you're thinking, and the answer is yes, I am available. Of course, it's time to go ahead and look at that mortgage, especially if you're in a 30 year loan. Check out at 1FMC or type in 1FMC.com in your browser. And we can't get out of here without giving a little plug to Melinda at Legacy Talent LLC. Uh, Rick, give us give us a new spin on, on why you should deal with Melinda. She's got the devil. Well, she is the brand builder. Well, we've just said that. Um, t- and on top of the fact that she's a genius when it comes to entertainment law, she's a brand builder, and uh, her company continues to uh, grow every day. She's hired now the uh, legal counsel from NASCAR, so that was a big pickup for her. She keeps expanding her, uh, her firm. And, uh, you know, there's a reason why she's got an office in California in an office in, uh, I mean, West Coast and in the South. So she goes back and forth. But if you can afford her, man, she'll rock your world. Check her out at Legacy Talent LLC. Rick, man, this was a hell of a show. Uh, it's a guest I never thought we would get. Lots of uh, folks have wanted this guest for a long time, and today we made it happen with your help, and I can't thank you enough for having me along. Oh, man, you're kidding. It was great. He is the man. Make no mistake. I even use, I used that saying for years, but... I never excluded him. I never uh, used that around him. (laughs) (laughs) We'll see you next week. This week on MLWRadio.com. Pull for Jim Corvette's drive-thru each and every Tuesday morning on this premium-only podcast. This week, Corny talks the Dusty Rhodes Gary Hart feud, Vince McMahon booking Japanese wrestlers, and broken Matt Hardy. Out now, over at the VIP Lounge, MVP talks with Cocaine Cowboys filmmaker and director Billy Corbin. Then, get the latest news and analysis on the network's flagship podcast, MLW Radio with MSL and ex-head WWE writer Alex Greenfield. On Thursday, learn about Cicero's disturbing stint performing for Handsome Boys Championship Wrestling. It's a new episode of Sardi and Mara Love Wrestling, plus much, much more. The world of MLW Radio never stops. Go to MLWRadio.com and binge on pro wrestling talk now. The world.